Okay, so um, thanks everyone. This has been a very exciting uh, six and a half weeks, and we are in the home, home stretch now. So it will be very interesting to see how this workshop ends. So uh, today I would like to start uh, by an illustration of why gas metallicity provides us with only a weak diagnostic of gas flows in the CGM. You know, it's useful, but at the same time, incomplete. I'll then demonstrate, in contrast, elemental abundance ratios can actually give us a, a fossil record of the chemical enrichment history. And for that reason, they can help us resolve the physical origin of the gas that we see in the CGM. I'll, of course, go over some caveats that we have to keep in mind when doing these kind of measurements. And finally, I'll show you some examples to convince you that this is a measurement that is not only possible, but also doable right now. So I would like to start with this old quote dating back from the 1830s, uh, which came from a French philosopher, Kant. Uh, you may recall him from your college philosophy class. He is known as the father of positivism. But in this case, which is probably not one of his prouder moments, he said that in the future, astronomers would be able to figure out the shapes, the sizes, the motions, and even the distance of the stars but for some reason, he believed that their chemical composition would forever be unavailable to us. As you know, clearly, clearly that didn't age well at all, because within less than 30 years from when he wrote this, modern spectroscopy was invented, and by the end of the 19th century, we would have figured out the chemical compositions for about 10,000 stars. But it does make me think a little bit, because what about the CGM? You know, is there much scientific value in studying the metallicities of the gaseous halo, can we actually use it to understand the physics of the CGM? It seems that this is still a matter of some debate, judging from a bunch of lively discussions that uh, took place in Slack over the past uh, couple of weeks and throughout the workshop, actually. So really, the practical side of this question is whether gas metallicity is a good diagnostic of different processes occurring in the CGM. And in some rare cases, you can actually make a case for that. So this is a figure from a paper that I wrote with Michael Rauch a couple of years ago, where we looked into the gaseous environment around a couple of low luminosity and low mass alignment alpha emitters at redshift of about three. We constrained the gas metallicity to no more than about 1% solar, and in some cases, as low as only a few times 10 to the minus four solar. And in this paper, we concluded that we were looking at evidence of ongoing accretion from IgM filaments onto these low mass galaxies. First of all, the metallicity, as I said, is really low, consistent with the enrichment level in the general Lyman alpha forest at the same redshift. At the same time, it is more than an order of magnitude higher than the ISM metallicity of these galaxies. We also see uh, a couple more evidence to support our claim. For example, we see really narrow line widths and low velocity dispersion in the absorber, suggesting a dynamically cold structure which is consistent with expectation from filamentary info in cosmological simulations. We also find that the closest Lyman alpha emitter in projection actually shows a blue peak dominant Lyman alpha emission, which is very, very rare. And that's, that's consistent with uh, expectation from radiative transfer in an inflowing structure. So basically, what I'm saying is metallicity can be a useful diagnostic. For, for that to be the case, you usually have to rely on multiple strands of evidence, not just the chemical abundances, but also the kinematics, the geometry, and the dynamics, and so on and so forth. But more often, things are a lot more complicated. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, during the outflow week, there was a lot of discussion, which also actually happened yesterday, about this azimuthal angle dependence of CGM absorbers. So let's look at this plot right here from a paper by Selim Peru back in 2016. Celine was investigating how gas metallicity around DLA host galaxies would vary as a function of azimuthal angle of the QSO sidelines. The simple expectation, if we assume that outflowing gas has a higher metallicity than outflowing gas, would be something like this on the left, where basically you see higher metallicities towards uh, the minor axis and lower metallicity towards the major axis. But instead, what Celine found seems counter to what's predicted by the simple physical picture. Because sometimes the gas that she detected along the minor axis can have very low metallicity, whereas the gas detected along major axis can have high metallicities. 
And here's a similar picture found by Stephanie Poynton from the Swinburne Group back in 2019. Again, Stephanie here was trying to search for a relationship between gas metallicity and the azimuthal angle. And again, she finds essentially no trend between these two quantities. So what I'm trying to say here is that things in the universe are probably a little more nuanced that we sometimes are ready to acknowledge. And the point I would like to make is that gas metallicity is a weak and at best incomplete diagnostic of gas flows in the CGM. Here is a more recent results from Zach Haven, who looked at the metallicity distribution in Lyman limit systems simulated in the fire simulations. Zach found that Lyman limit systems in Lyman limit systems, inflowing gas does tend to have lower metallicity than outflowing gas in, on average, but there is still a lot of overlap between them in terms of their metallicity distribution. And on the observational side, here are some of my own work with cost LRG. Looking at the gas metallicity in the CGM of massive galaxies, I found large metallicity variations often more than a factor of 10 within individual halos, and this seems to be a common feature in the CGM of these massive galaxies. So I wrote the following in the paper, and to my delight, here's a very similar statement in Zach's paper. It makes me happy because, you know, this is one of those rare instances in which there is actually a perfect agreement between theorists and observers. And I mean, it does make sense because, you know, you have a background sideline cutting through a path length of over several hundreds of parsecs often throughout the halo. So if that's the case, it's really not that surprising to encounter gas which has multiple different origins, is it? So where do we go from here? I would like to show you this picture of the M81 system to drive this point home. This is a beautiful image uh, showing a large scale map of neutral hydrogen distribution around M81 and, it, and its companion galaxies. You can see here a large covering fraction of optically thick H1 gas within 50 kiloparsec or so. The reason I like this picture is because, number one, this is real data, and number two, it shows us that the universe is really a complex and messy place where things are never as simple as we want them to be. We see so many things going on here, rotating disk, strip gas, outflows, and so on. And with such a mess in the CGM, it's natural to wonder, is it really a hope situ situation after all? Well, honestly, this is a, a trick question because the answer is, uh, to me, no, or otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk. I'm not a defeatist, I'm, I'm not going to declare a loss here. I don't doubt the scientific utility of measuring metallicities, but I think we, as a community, we need to do better in the future than we have been in the past, because there are other things that we need to consider, because they may help us in our effort in the future. So what I'm here to advocate today is that we can use elemental abundance ratios to help us establish a stronger physical ties between the diffuse gas that we see in the CGM and all the different processes that happen in galaxies over different time scales. And by the end of this discussion, I hope I, I can convince you that this is not only possible, but also doable. So to motivate this discussion, this is an, a good old periodic table that we are all familiar from high school. And except this one came from a recent review by Jennifer Johnson. And what's different about this is that it has been color coded by the different nuclear synthetic origins for the gas. You see, you know, Big Bang fission, exploding massive stars, white dwarfs, type 1 supernova, and so on. And here in squares are some of the common elements that we often see in their various guises of ionization in absorption line studies. And based on this, this is why relative abundances of different elements are kind of amazing, because they provide us with an, some kind of an archaeological record, record of past enrichment episodes that the gas has been subject to. So for a long time, this type of investigation has been done, but it remained primarily the domain of people investigating chemical abundances in damp iron alpha systems. Why is that? Well, because for, for, with, with DLAs, you don't really have to worry about ionization effects on account that the gas is incredibly optically thick, although you do have other issues that we'll go over a little later. And this kind of investigation became possible basically as soon as we were able to get high resolution spectra of large sample of QSOs, which happened after CAC and HiRES were installed in the 90s. 
Um, so here is one important early work investigating chemical enrichment history in high-rachif DLAs uh, from the mid-90s. So this plot shows the observed elemental abundance ratios of different elements plotted relative to the elemental iron abundance or metallicity of the gas. So you can see some common features here, the most prominent of which, the one I circle, is perhaps the fact that DLAs show a predominantly alpha element in rich abundance pattern. And that's exactly what you expect, uh, and that's exactly what the authors concluded, that the bulk of heavy elements in DLAs were produced basically by core collapse supernova in massive stars, and that there were negligible contributions at the high redshifts from intermediate and low mass stars or from type 1A supernova. So this is another example from my own work. And in this case, I was searching for and looking at the properties of cool gas at only a few projected kiloparsec away from massive elliptical galaxies using gravitational lenses. And what's super interesting is what I found when I looked at the relative abundances of iron and magnesium in the gas. So these two plots show the observed iron to magnesium ratio of individual absorption components in the y-axis versus the velocity of each component in the x-axis. The solar iron to magnesium level is marked with the horizontal line. And by observed here, I mean singly ionized iron and singly ionized magnesium. What I found is that whenever cool gas is detected, it shows uniformly high solar level or even supersolar iron to magnesium abundance ratio across the full kinematic spread of the gas, suggesting that the gas has been highly enriched in iron. This indicates that the gas has been highly enriched by type 1A supernova, which, as you may recall, is in contrast to those high relative DLA measurements we just saw before. And since I've done this, there has been more measurement of iron to magnesium ratio in lens galaxies, which confirm our conclusion. You may check out a recent paper here by Francis Cashman from Varsha Kukani's group in South Carolina. So because of this different nuclear synthetic origin, we can obtain valuable in insights into the origin of the gas by examining the chemical makeup of this GM and its variations with, for example, star formation history and distance from galaxies. So this is a plot of the radial profile of the observed iron to magnesium ratio as a function of distance in the cool CGM. Passive galaxies here are shown in red, while star forming galaxies are shown in blue. So there are a number of interesting things that you can see here. First, you see elevated iron to alpha ratios in the CGM of ellipticals compared to star forming galaxies. And second, it looks like the iron to alpha ratio in the CGM of passive galaxies declines with increasing distance. So what this tells us is that within about 30 kiloparsec or less from massive ellipticals, type 1A supernova have contributed significantly to the chemical enrichment. On the other hand, the outer CGM is iron poor but rich in alpha capture elements, indicating a much earlier enrichment epoch. And this is consistent with a more chemically primitive gas which has been accreted from the IGM. What this also suggests is that type 1A supernova may play an important role to regulate the gas cycle in massive galaxies. And this is one more reason why this is really interesting. Um, the magenta rectangle here marks the range of measured iron to alpha ratio in X-ray observations in the hot atmosphere in X-ray of local ellipticals. And the interesting he thing here is that you can see that it is consistent with what we see in the cooler phase of the CGM, both in terms of the mean value as well as the range of the value see seen. And the reason I want to show this is some recent observations have discovered a correlation between molecular gas mass and total mass of the hot atmosphere in a wide range of elliptical galaxies. So this kind of correlation points to a possible causal relation between the hot halo and the cooler gas. And I think the sheer similarity in chemical composition seen here supports this idea that condensation from the hot atmosphere could be a significant source of the cool gas, at least closer into the galaxies at 10 kiloparsec scale or so. And by the way, this idea of cooling from the hot halo is the topic of a new results video that I posted a couple of weeks ago. 
And if you haven't seen it, make sure to check it out. Here's a QR code that you can scan with your phone and it will lead you to the video. I will post the slides later. All right, so let's go over some caveats. Here are a couple of things that you might want to consider if you want to start measuring elemental abundance ratios in the CGM. The first potential complication is differential dust depletion. This arises simply from the fact that some elements are more refractory than others, meaning that they have a higher condensation temperature and so they go into dust grains more easily. A good example of this is chromium, manganese, and iron. So this plot from Annalisa de Chia's paper a few years ago shows you the depletion sequence of some elements. Elements on the right of the plot here are more easily depleted into dust than the ones on the left. And so we have known for a while that this effect is most severe for things like DLAs. But it can also be important in strong element limit systems, especially if they have high metallicity. But thankfully, this is something that we can correct for. You can, for instance, use the observed ratios of zinc relative to iron in the gas, which we know have very little nucleosynthetic difference over a wide range of metallicities based on measurements of Milky Way stars. And we can use this to infer how dusty the environment is. And then we can correct for the expected level of dust depletion in some elements, like for example, iron and magnesium, and then correct your gas metallicity, your abundance ratio accordingly. Another thing that you have to consider is the anion correction. Why is that? Well, that's simply because we observe ions in the CGM and ionic ratios. So if you want to convert the relative abundances of ions into the elemental abundance ratio, you have to first correct that by the relative ionization fraction of the two elements, like what I'm showing you here for iron and magnesium. So to show you some example, this plot on the right shows you how the relative ionization fraction of magnesium and iron changes as a function of gas density for both an optically thin and optically thick gas. These are calculations done with Cloudy, the photoionization code. So you can see that for iron and magnesium, there is actually little differential ionization correction if you are comfortably in the optically thick regime, like Lyman limit systems and DLAs. But this effect can be important if you are dealing with optically thin gas, especially at low gas densities. And the way to take this into account, which is probably already obvious to you, is to perform a careful ionization modeling of the gas. So this kind of analysis will often require you to both decompose the gas into multiple components and then model each of the components carefully. You may also find that you need to invoke more than just one single phase of gas in order to reproduce the data, like what we've heard from Jane Charlton and Samir earlier in the workshop. We also heard from Chris earlier about how you can use this kind of modeling, for instance, to infer the sizes of clouds in the CGM. He's absolutely right, of course, that we should be careful about considering the error budget due to, for instance, uncertainties in the radiation field, as well as, you know, other things. But this, if you do this carefully enough, um, I would like to just show you for the last few minutes of my talk a taste of some of the things that we are already able to do and learn now through this kind of careful analysis. So these are some really new results from an upcoming paper I'm writing based on my work with the COPS collaboration, which should be out in several weeks. So here I am looking into the chemical abundance ratios and gas metallicity in Lyman limit systems based on detailed component by component ionization analysis. And this is one of them. So our measurements um, of both metallicities in the x-axis and nitrogen to alpha ratio on the y-axis are shown with blue stars here, with each one marking an individual absorption component. The other points here show you measurements of gas phase abundances and ratios in individual H2 regions of both normal spiral galaxies and dwarf galaxies. So as, as you can see, both the overall metallicities and the N to alpha ratios are consistent with the observed values in the individual regions of dwarf galaxies. You may ask then, what about the galaxy environments? So here it is. It turns out that 
there are actually a close pair of low mass galaxies within a projected 20 to 30 kiloparsec away from the background sideline here. So isn't that interesting? Because um, where might the gas have come from there? Then uh, one likely explanation is that you are looking at strip interstellar medium gas from one or both of these dwarf galaxies. And perhaps that could be a result of some recent gravitational interactions between this close pair of dwarf galaxies. I think we have one minute or so, so let me just show you another example. This is another Lyman limit system at a somewhat higher redshift of 0.6. And again, as before, the blue stars here are my data points. So what do we have here now? So these components, as you can see, are more metal rich than what we saw in the previous system I showed you. In this case, the components ranges from a third solar to slightly above solar metallicity. What, but what's also interesting here is that the gas is also rich in iron and in nitrogen relative to the alpha elements. So here's the plot showing the iron to alpha ratios versus the metallicity. But one of the components, this one, which would actually be classified as a partial alignment limit system because the column density is 16.5 in H1 in log, is actually both metal rich, solar metallicity, and yet, at the same time, highly alpha enriched. In fact, the observed iron to alpha ratio for this one is actually comparable to what has been observed in the halo stars in the Milky Way. So what about the galaxy environment? Here it is. This is a false color image ma made from a MUSE uh, integral field data cube of this system. So this environment appears to be pretty isolated and kind of lonely environment actually in which the only galaxy we find at less than 300 kiloparsec away is a super L star star forming galaxy within about 30 kiloparsec in projection which is shown here and what's interesting is the sideline probes the galaxy within less than 30 degrees from its minor axis so if you just focus on this one alpha element enriched environment both the high metallicity of the gas and the alpha in rich nature are consistent with the expected chemical signature from the gas expelled in a star formation driven wind. In fact, here are the observed values in the hot outflow of M82, which is kind of very close to where our data point is. So that's cool, but then how can you explain these other iron rich and metal rich components? Because they are iron rich, but at the same time also metal rich, which suggests that they are more chemically evolved than the other component. So one possible explanation is that this possible galactic wind is not only expelling newly produced fresh material from core collapse supernova, but it's also expelling some existing ISM data from the galaxy itself. So if you would like to know more, just stay tuned for our latest paper from COPS, which should be out in only a matter of weeks now. So basically that's all I wanted to say. I'll just summarize by saying that gas metallicity measurements in the CGM are great, but they give us only a, an incomplete, at best, diagnostic of the dynamical process in the CGM. I hope I have convinced you that elemental abundance ratios are awesome because they provide a fossil record of the chemical enrichment history. And finally, when you couple them with knowledge of metallicity, the kinematics, and also a deep galaxy survey, elemental ratios can provide us with a really powerful tool to resolve the chemical origin of CGM gas and also break some well-known degeneracies in observations in the process. So I'll just close by saying that this kind of investigation is not only possible, but actually doable as long as one takes into account all the caveats that I went over before. So let's try to get more of these kind of measurements done in the near future, shall we? That will be awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Fari. That was great. A really, really nice uh, presentation there. Um, let's uh, let's give uh, take one question here, and um, we'll move you to a breakout room afterwards. Um, where... All right. Yeah, let's see um, if anybody wants to raise their hand or even speak up. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll ask something like the iron, you know, the the excess iron you see around ellipticals, is that because of um, like kind of intercluster or uh, halo type 1a supernova going off? Um, what's the origin of that? So that's an interesting question, Ben, because um, people who look into uh, the 
iron abundances in intercluster gas actually did find an excess in iron relative to the alpha elements in the hot in the hot um, uh, intercluster medium around these clusters. And it's interesting that this is also something that we see in these uh, elliptical gas within about you know 20, 30 kiloparsec or so. So I think um, what's going on here is that um, you um, you're looking into um, enrichment from more recent type 1 supernova exploding just in the uh, in situ within uh, you know the cluster itself because if you look within these galaxies themselves because if you look at the light distribution of these elliptical galaxies uh, you actually see an extended stellar distribution envelope all the way out to often 100 kiloparsec so uh, it, it is conceivable that that you still see um, in situ type 1 supernova exploding even you know at a few tens of kiloparsec away from these elliptical galaxies so i think these are really you're really looking at um, you know more recent you know excess enrichment in iron close to these galaxies compared to you know further out at 100 kiloparsec in the cgm what's the maximum fe <clears throat> over alpha ratio you can get if like from type 1a supernova ejecta uh, yield models I think if you are if you are looking at a purely type one supernova, you can easily get you know a, a factor of three or a factor of four or even five more than in alpha elements wow. if you have a pure ejecta. And really, what, what we see here in 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 these electrical gases should really be strictly interpreted as a lower limit because again, there is a, a possibility that you're looking at a significant dust depletion around close to these ellipticals because the metallicity is really, really high. In fact, in some cases, we see actually molecular gas in uh, around one of these uh, lens galaxies. So uh, the actual elemental ratios could be even higher than what we reported here. Really interesting. <clears throat> Great. Um, well, I, I encourage you to um, uh, go to that, uh, uh, continue this uh, conversation uh, with Fari in uh, his breakout room. Uh, and if you need help being sent there, just just uh, um, let me know. And that will uh, close our official recorded program here. Um, but I see activity in, in at least two of the other rooms. So I will broadcast a message to all. And thank you all for coming today. Great tutorials all around, very high standard. <laughs>